Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Swiss Revolver of 1878, an honest-to-god Warnant revolver, with minor modifications from Krauser and maybe Schmidt, but more on that after we get a look at this beauty in the light box. With an overall length of 11 inches and weighing in at 2.4 pounds, this gun is surprisingly large despite its modern appearance. It chambers the 10.4 Swiss Ordnance cartridge, six of them in the cylinder, and take special note, there's no loading gate. That's on purpose. If you're watching this video, I can almost guarantee that you love these guns more than YouTube does, because they don't like giving us very much coin. Instead, this show is supported by people on Utreon, Patreon, donors, right? Uh, and if you don't do those, then maybe come by our shop over on the website. But the short answer is, you guys make this show possible even more so than May and I's hard work. So stop on by and support us if you can. Let's get into it. I'm extremely pleased to finally be able to cover this influential revolver. But before we can cover the what, we have to explore the why. And to do that, I'm going to have to very quickly, and in a fairly shallow manner, skip along some Swiss history. For starters, this is Switzerland. For many, it evokes thoughts of mountains and valleys, chocolate, watches, and pocket knives. But take note of its neighbors. This famously neutral nation is smack dab in the middle of constantly quarreling powers, so Swiss neutrality would have to have some teeth in order to be effective. Now, about the time that early revolvers were really starting to work their way into military service, Switzerland was still a little less hard-boiled than we think of it today. As a matter of fact, as recently as 1847, they had been fighting internally. The Sonderbund War saw the defeat of an alliance of cantons who resisted federalization of power. This conflict essentially crystallized the unified Swiss nation as we think of it today. Now, pay attention to that date, because the Swiss standard handgun at that time was the Model 1842. This was a percussion cap modification of their 1817 flintlock pistol, perfectly modern on adoption, but soon to be obsoleted by the works of Colt and Adams. Thanks to our repercussion episodes, we've started to see the origins of the revolving pistol. At this point, we've shown you the Patterson, Colt's premier percussion cap revolver, technologically significant, if somewhat poorly executed. Despite being available in 1836, this design wasn't suited for military service. However, over a decade later, the more rugged Walker would be developed, and despite being a tad oversized, it became the template for a Marshall multi-shot pistol. By 1850, the Swiss Federal Military Department would have a Colt Dragoon on hand, a slightly improved and lightened walker. They would also have a copy of the U.S. Senate report of February 1849, detailing martial opinions on the benefits and risks of adopting revolving pistols. Ultimately, the Colt had failed to impress on them any great need for its adoption at the time. And so, the years would pass. Every few, another design would be considered, and every time it was found to be wanting, usually because of concerns around durability and especially cost. Now, to be fair to Switzerland, despite resisting a modern handgun, they were very happy to be on the ground floor for magazine-fed metallic cartridge rifles, which was a much more important factor in their defense. That did mean, however, that by the early 1870s, the old percussion pistols were plainly obsolete. It was time to adopt a metallic cartridge revolver. So, testing was begun again in 1870, and over several years they would trial various designs. The first to see real consideration was the Adams, but it was considered heavy and slow. The Belgian-made Galand, however, garnered much more attention, and a handful of modified pieces were even made for trials in Switzerland. They were very excited at the prospect of rapidly unloading, but the action proved too weak for service. Similar excitement and disappointment was found in the Smith & Wesson No. 3 revolvers. And so it was no wonder they would eventually turn to a more conservative, solid-framed revolver, the Chamlow Delvin. As the testing progressed from simple research into, well frankly, small-scale manufacture for trials pieces, a proper revolver commission was formed. Presided over by engineer, artillery officer, and chief instructor of the artillery, then freshly promoted to Colonel Hermann Bleuler. The commission also gathered a number of talented Swiss officers, including a name we might recognize from his later work on rifles. Then Staff Major Rudolf Schmidt, a man we've covered in more detail on our Schmidt Rubin rifle episodes, and strangely, someone we will discuss more in our next episode than we will today. Schmidt was largely responsible for changes to the Belgian-produced Chamlo Delvin, which made it acceptable for adoption in 1872. 
The result was a rugged, single and double action, solid frame, singularly loading and unloading revolver. Switzerland had wanted 3,000 revolvers, and the Chamelot Delvin was being sold to them by the brothers Pierlo over in Belgium. They priced them at 50 Swiss franc apiece. However, the commission felt that the price could be lower, perhaps with domestic production, which was already favored for most arms anyway. So the contract was shrunk significantly to only 800 pieces out of Belgium at 55 franc a pop. Pierlo expected to receive either more orders or royalties on further production. Now, just to seal Schmidt's involvement in this process, the finished revolvers were actually marked CDS for Chamelot, Delvin, and Schmidt, and Rudolf would receive a reward of 300 Swiss franc for his efforts. While I do not have a Swiss Chamelot Delvin here, the same mechanism was adopted by the French and the Italians, and I do have an Italian one. While this isn't our gun for today, I'd really like to show you just a few details to help you understand why they would later choose the 1878. Now, the Italian 1874 has some differences between it and the original Swiss 1872. However, what we care about is on the inside, and it's close enough for what we're doing today. So, on this gun, I've gone ahead and pre-loosened the takedown screw, and again, with the screwdriver, you would pry up on the edge here. There's some cuts for that. And we're into the action. Separate plate, separate screw, all to be lost. We remove our grip, and boom, we're inside. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we do have to cover just a little bit so we can appreciate the later 78. We have a trigger, a sear, and a hammer, along with a strut for double action, and a hand for rotating that cylinder. Now, almost all of these have their own springs. Main spring for the hammer, this spring for the sear, a, a V spring for the trigger all by itself. And then, thankfully, there is one flat spring that is doing double duty. It's powering the hand and the strut. That is everything in the Shamlow Delvin. Now, all of it works together like this. We single action cock and we catch on the sear. Tipping the trigger tips the sear, which releases the hammer to fall. Boom. For double action, we simply pull the trigger, which pushes on this strut, which pushes the hammer over center rearward until it's able to slip past, at which point the hammer falls. In both cases, you'll notice that the hammer stays down once down. That means that the firing pin is projecting into the frame and it can have some consequences that we'll discuss in a moment. You must manually rebound that hammer if you want to be able to free spin that cylinder, load and unload. That manual operation is something that could be a problem to someone in a hurry or someone who wasn't paying attention, and it creates a potential maintenance point. Again, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But just notice the, well, honestly, despite being rugged, rugged this is a very complicated pistol. Now, technically, the firing pin on the Swiss gun was just a bit different because they hadn't gone with a center fire cartridge. When developing their metallic cartridge, the Swiss Commission had opted to stay in line with their rifle ammunition. The result was a 10.4 ordnance cartridge, same diameter as their rifle and thus able to make use of existing machinery. Also, like the rifle cartridge, this was a rim fire round, which actually created another problem down the line. The rim had to be thin enough to be struck in order to reliably set off the round crush, right? That same flexibility, however, went both ways. Cases would then bulge on firing, and they would actually bind the revolver's action, inhibiting rotation and making for an awful trigger pull on the follow-up shots, getting worse the more rounds you fired. The Sham Low wasn't doing as well in service as they had hoped, and so a series of tests began again. Skipping just a bit ahead, only 100 more PLO revolvers would be ordered, delivering in 1877, making this original Shamlo revolver a rare thing to encounter today. And as we'll see in a moment, an original in rimfire is practically mythical. So the 1872 wasn't going well, time for trialing some more revolvers, which is exactly when I wish we had done this episode before uh, the Schmidt Rubin straight pull rifle. In covering the 1889, we managed to roughly convey the Swiss arms industry's competitive and incestuous processes. Basically, Swiss artillery officers had a habit of being deeply involved in their own designs or the work of friendly inventors. Even when your own gun might not be winning, there was usually some effort to work in elements of your own design. I won't be trying to dig up every memo and letter, but just know 
that there's a lot of special interest elbowing as the Revolver Commission went back to work. Disputes aside, the need to improve on the Shamlo created an opportunity to solve a problem that had existed even before its adoption. How to get rapid unloading without compromising on the strength of the firearm. Sure, top brakes were fast, but they were complicated and flimsy. Wasn't there something else that could be done? Well, you could always go with a solid frame auto ejector, which is what was put forward in 1873, the von Steiger design, loaded from the left and ejected on the right. This was advanced by a former Swiss armorer, now working as foreman for Steiger's weapons factory. This mechanism was developed over the next several years through various demonstrations and minor trials in Switzerland. You can see more of these in this video from Forgotten Weapons. However, the mechanism proved too complicated and unreliable, and the Steiger would not see adoption. In 1875, the Swiss Revolver Commission would settle on a new 10.4mm center fire cartridge. This would become the standard for further trials, and ultimately, the adopted cartridge for the army as a whole. Its resemblance to the rimfire cartridge was not just for familiarity's sake. Keeping the same dimensions meant that the previous 1872 rimfire revolvers could more easily be converted to the new cartridge, and Rudolf Schmidt would submit 12 trials pistols so modified again in 1875. These also featured a cut between the chambers in order to prevent the firing pin from being damaged uh, because of, well, the lack of an automatic rebound like we saw. With very few changes, Schmidt modifications would be adopted in 1878 when our new revolver was introduced as a means of keeping the old Shamlows in service. But of course, before that, they had to pick the new revolver for 1878. Rudolf Schmidt also made a bid for that coveted slot, submitting a Shamlow Delvine action paired with a pivoting barrel and cylinder assembly. So unlock, rotate, and smack the ejector plunger. Ultimately, the commission still did not want a split-frame gun, though. Since solid frame was preferred, foreman of the Federal Arms Factory Ernst Krauser would submit his own simplified auto-ejector in 1876. His design was fitted to a fairly standard Shamlow Delvine action, proving that it could be used to convert existing models, which actually kept it in the running as it was generally found to be inferior to the previous Steiger at first. Now, so far we've only been seeing recommended changes to the loading and unloading of these revolvers. It actually appears that the Shamlo Delvin lockwork was all right with the Swiss so far. No, that was until Jean Warnant wandered into the picture and ruined everything. Born in February 1845 in what I assume is Hogni Charate, I don't speak Belgian, near Liège, Belgium, Jean Warnant was the second son of Leonard Joseph Warnant, a pistol lockmaker. Now, sadly, despite his influence on firearms design, there really isn't a lot of biographical data readily available for Jean Warnant. This is actually a recurring issue I've found with a number of minor Belgian gunsmiths and their patents, even though they all sort of pull together to form what we think of as the modern revolver. I hope we can help rectify that someday. By the middle 1870s, Jean had entered business with his younger brother Louis, producing hinge-framed revolvers on their own patent of 1874. The following year, Jean would solve a long-standing issue with firearms design. While in the context of our show today, he applied the solution to a solid frame firearm, I'm suspecting his inspiration came from his manufacture of top brakes in his own workshop. Let me show you what I mean. Let's return to our Shamlo Delvine for just a moment. If I go ahead and drop this hammer and don't rebound it, okay? When we try to open the gate and load the gun, if we're not paying attention, and we roll on this guy, that is the sound of the inside of the chamber wall striking the firing pin on the hammer. This guy right here is getting beat from the left and right. And if you give this to somebody who is not paying attention or not very delicate, they can really do some damage. I've seen a lot of guns that don't have rebound systems with just broken firing pins. And so it can be very critical to make sure that this is out of the way before you try to load and unload or else you're gonna do damage to that gun. Uh, some guns will have a uh, ring cut in between the chambers. They would ultimately do that on the 1872 eventually in order to prevent the firing pin from being damaged if you rotate the cylinder while the gun is unloaded. However, this still doesn't do you any favors if the gun is partially or fully loaded. <sighs> this Smith & Wesson new Navy, or also known as the uh, first model double action, 
is also a Shamlo Delvine, believe it or not, internally. However, it has a top break action. So we have that same problem of dropping the hammer, it not rebounding, and then in theory, you could have cylinder slap, but in this case, the stops prevent that from happening. Although, well, human beings will find a way to get out of order, but in theory, again, it shouldn't be able to slap down. However, another problem arises with this particular top break from its lack of being able to rebound. While this wasn't faced by the Swiss, I think it's worth mentioning because I want you to know why rebounding hammers are important. So if we were to open this up in order to unload and then reload it, and that hammer were down and not rebounded, and we go ahead and line up our chambers, and we just happen to load one right in line with the barrel, right in line with the firing pin, and snap it closed, we might have had a bad time, or at least some cowboy over there might have had a bad time unexpectedly, because, <laughs> well, that just dropped, didn't it? Just from the other direction. So a rebounding, automatically rebounding hammer would be a good idea for something like this, because how much do you trust your buddy to remember that little click every time? Now, just to show you what other people had considered before on this problem, this is a spear lay, which opens from the bottom up and has an ejector that you manually operate. Now, this gun is also prone to the problem of slamming shut on the firing pin. So, if you notice, when I release, it does not automatically rebound. How did they avoid the problem? Well, it's simple. They put a camming surface here at the hinge that's going to move the hammer as we open the gun. Rebounds it, and then, yep, it's in position. I'm not sure that I'd call that an automatic rebound though, because we manually rebounded it by opening the action and it certainly doesn't prevent this scenario where we slap while we have the empty gun. So, eh, points, but not what we're looking for. Instead, the warrant system solves all of our problems nicely by being truly automatic. So gun goes bang, release trigger, and it rebounds. There's no chance of us coming into conflict with the firing pin in any of our operations. This is very significant. It appears that Warnant contracted with another Belgian firm, uh, Alphonse Scholberg et Jade, in order to manufacture his submission. His new revolver would appear before the Swiss Commission in April of 1876. It arrived alongside a centerfire modification of the previously pinfire Javel revolver. This odd tip forward design was far too weak for the Swiss, who had already rejected anything but a solid frame to this point. Warnant's revolver, however, garnered attention right away. His rebounding hammer nicely solved the problem of damaged firing pins and prevented dragging over the primers. Moreover, his lockwork was sublimely simple, and while it only had a manual ejector rod, the design was exceptional. It wasn't, of course, perfect though. For starters, it was in 12 millimeter. So the commission ordered 10 sample warnants, this time in their own 10.4 millimeter cartridge. Now about the same time in the background, the Steiger auto ejector was still leading the pack. So 10 of those were ordered for comparative trials. And this is where things get a little weird. From the writings available to me, there are no images or descriptions of the 10 requested pure 10.4 millimeter Warnant revolvers. Instead, I do see images of a Warnant hybrid, which is also listed in the notes. It was pointed out that the Krauser ejector, which was failing against the Steiger overall, but could be used to convert Shamlows, well, it was also compatible with the construction of the Warnant. So, 10 Warnant Krausers were also ordered, and we know they were produced, with the mechanism further improved by Professor Amsler Laffen. Manufactured at Waffen Fabrik Bern during 1877, apparently five were made as pictured here. The other five, it says, were modified, basically with an Abadie-like hammer safety. More on why that was thought to be necessary in just a moment. It's important to note that on this design, there's no loading gate. The Krausers were used just like the Steigers, loaded on the left by pushing past a sort of detent spring. Uh, the ejector had to be able to do its thing on the right-hand side, so again, no gates. And here is where, yet again, I lack data. Something changes in the Krauser design around 1876, and we can see the result in our drawing. Here are the cylinder stops, which align the cylinder and bore uh, at the moment of fire. But here is another set of stops offset from the first, meaning a total of 12 possible positions of the cylinder. These forward stops are engaged by a lug on the trigger, meaning they only work when the trigger is relaxed, when you have not pulled the trigger. 
These forward stops also have a lot of wear from dragging across the trigger's lug, which leads me to believe they serve as a sort of detent position. My suspicion, one that I haven't been able to confirm as I haven't managed to find a Krauser to handle, especially that one that old, is that these extra stops provided a detent position in which the revolver could be carried after loading. Not for loading, but having been loaded and is now being carried. Without being able to offset the cylinder, whatever round was aligned when you last loaded the gun would always be right there in the ejection port and willing to fall out. Later, in 1877, the Warnick Krauser would be fitted with a reinforcing band around the cylinder. This provided those same forward notches, but with lots more room for wear, and I'm betting it was easier to manually index. Obviously, I mention this band because it remained on our revolver today. However, there appears to be sort of an inversion of when it's supposed to be used. Over a series of trials, the Steiger ejector would be dropped from consideration. Despite certain advantages, it was just too complicated and wasn't flexible enough to be applied to various mechanisms. The Krauser was now winning favor, but there was still a third option, the status quo. Basically, the debate was now settling into whether or not an auto ejector was even a good idea at all. And while I don't have a Krauser or a Steiger here, I am actually lucky enough to have an auto ejector, which can show us some of the major problems. Now this little guy is definitely not anything the Swiss were dealing with. This is a Webley RIC that has been modified with what is popularly known as the expert package. This guy has a manual hammer safety and an automatic ejector. The automatic ejector is what we're going to use to understand why nobody likes automatic ejectors. We're a little tight in here, but I want you guys to see what's going on. Ignore the gate because that one had been present in the Swiss design. As a matter of fact, the way the gate works on this one, this gun is meant to not eject while live firing. You're supposed to dry fire it to eject all of them. We're going to assume the Swiss pattern, which is that they would be firing while things are flying out the back, right? So uh, unlike the Swiss again, our sort of flicker is overhand and it's coming in from sort of the top right corner. On the Swiss systems, they tended to be at the bottom flicking out, but it's still a flicking action and it's still powered by a sort of teeter-totter mechanism, which is being slapped on the other side by the hammer. So in this case, the idea is you would cock the hammer back or double action fire it. And then when the hammer comes crashing down, it's gonna hit this side of this bar and you see it flexing over there by the uh, cylinder. And so therefore it's gonna rip that case right out. You can tell on early 450 with a separate bottom, <laughs> that's probably not gonna work out great, but that's a story for another day. So if we fire that, it would kick one out and then we would fire again. And then I actually have a spent case hidden in here. So there's our spent case. Now this one requires a lot of tension to drive this guy forward to make sure he really gets under the rim. In this case, I've allowed it to pre-position pretty well. So it's gonna snug in there pretty good and easy. So right now, we have a lip from our flicker sitting up under the rim of our case, okay? And then when I drop this hammer, it's going to hit this pivot point. The problem is that this is a very old gun and the mainspring is probably a, almost lighter than the, the bias spring on this. So she don't work so good. Let's see how far we get. <laughs> yeah, we didn't get her all the way out, but you can see what it was trying to do. It was trying to pop this guy clear. Ooh, he's still a little bit sticky. Let's see. Oh God, <laughs> an unclean chamber and a hundred years of mung. Well, yeah. All right, let me go ahead and use the good old fashioned. Well, that's obviously a clear demonstration of the fact that this is unreliable, but also, you know, dirty chambers, hundred something years, this is what happens. But the reason why that doesn't work so well is we're not slapping it hard enough, right? Well, we're not slapping it hard enough because the mainspring is not delivering enough power against the spring that biases this back forward to make sure it picks up a rim. If you think about it, not only is there the problem we just encountered, but also we may end up with a misfire because now our mainspring is in conflict with another spring even to reach the primer of the next round. That's another point against this sort of system. In addition, if you think about loading this guy up with six rounds, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Well, now we have a live one here and we'd have a live one right here under the ejector. And so when we fired, actually in this case, it would bring over the next one, boom. Well, what do we just do? We just kicked out another live round. A perfectly good round just went into the ether and we only have five shots. Also not great. When you wanna unload this, assuming you've somehow managed to get six shots to go off, 
which again, we learned we can't even do that. You then have to pull the trigger dry one more time to get one empty out. That doesn't seem like a big deal until you realize this is supposed to be a combat revolver. So you're supposed to load it up and then the whole point of it auto ejecting is to make your life easier in terms of reloading it, which means you have to train to fire a, well, a sixth round of the five rounds you fired because you threw a live one on the ground. And then you then have to you know, fire that sixth round so that you can load up six more so you can throw one on the ground. You get my idea. This is getting a little bit nutty. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, if you intend to let it auto eject while firing, that's a lot of math, especially for someone that might be in a firefight. Granted, this doesn't work exactly the same way as the Krauser, but the problems were similar. So it's no wonder that as things progressed, there was growing concern about the inclusion of an auto ejecting system at all. Even while the trials were underway, Rudolf Schmidt would introduce yet another design, now basing his work off the Warnant revolver, but using a Mariette-style hammer nose, paired with the then very new Abadie gate-loading safety. While largely ignored in 1877, we'll actually see this reappear real soon. Now, a majority of the revolver commission continued to favor using an auto ejection system, while a minority of the officers were seriously concerned about it. In order to keep things moving, a compromise was reached. They would attempt a revolver capable of accepting the auto ejector and yet also sporting an ejector rod. This sample was the final one shipped from Scholberg et Jade in Liège. Serialed as the number eight, this was a largely warnant configuration revolver. Same lockwork, hinged cover plate, which also formed the upper half of the left grip panel and fitted with the excellently constructed but otherwise traditional ejector rod. However, this design still left room for an auto ejector, sporting the Krauser loading positions ring wrapped around the cylinder and lacking any sort of loading gate. Unlike the previous Krauser pistols though, this one was apparently meant to load and eject on the right and skipped having a flat spring pseudo gate, opting to just use the timing of the lockwork to prevent the cartridges from escaping, which was made possible due to changes in that cylinder band. And just as a last detail, the front of the cylinder is now checkered to provide a nice gripping surface for manual indexing. After testing, the number eight design, paired with a Krauser ejector, was approved by the commission sometime in the spring of 1878. However, when the decision was carried up to the military department as a whole, the concerns began all over again. Several members of the federal council uh, organized another series of shooting tests. And again, the debate raged about whether or not to have an auto ejecting system. But the final decision was actually a financial one. The number eight pistol made without the auto ejector was cheaper. However, it was felt that the auto ejector could be perfected or would somehow be later needed. The design was such that they could be added later without much difficulty. So the number eight model was adopted with the Krauser cylinder and no loading gate, but without the actual ejector. The matter was approved in September of 1878. At the same time, a conversion program for the Model 1872 Shamlo was also approved and put into action. Although they only chose to adapt them to centerfire and not to add any fancy rebounds or ejectors or anything like that. So, the September order made this guy right here the Model of 1878. And yet, it didn't quite look like this gun. Over the course of the revolver trials, Rudolf Schmidt had gained a new title. Starting in 1875, he had become the director of the rather new Waffenfabrik Bern. He was also now responsible for tooling up production for the 1878 revolver. He recommended 10 further modifications to the would-be service pistol. My god, they can't stop poking at it. Anyway, the requested changes were then turned over to another trusted gunsmith, Friedrich Vetterli who we should recognize from his rifle. Vetterly was now serving as the head of the technical department of the War Material Administration. He would endorse just a few of Schmidt's 10 points, not all of them. Let's go through what they did change. The mainspring was lengthened and an additional extension lever was implemented. More on why in a moment. The hammer was given a traditional stirrup in order to smooth out operation. The cover plate was changed, now integrating the trigger guard, but no longer covering part of the grip panel. The barrel was matched exactly to the 1872 Shamlo. This would ease conversion and sighting of the pistols for their shared centerfire ammo. And the front part of the frame was thickened up a bit, no longer having that bit of scallop. 
The improved design was sealed by a council decision on December 24th, 1879, over a year after the original 1878 adoption. So I guess maybe we should call this the 79. They called it the 78. So we can finally get a look at our unusual revolver today. Ooh, what a big, beautiful pistol. Now, this gun at its heart is a single mm -hmm. and double action revolver. That is lovely. We have no loading gate whatsoever. And instead we must manually index mm, to one of six loaded positions. And when we're there, we can either load or we can take our ejector rod, flip her over, not, let's see, there's position one, folded away and covering our arbor. There's sort of a neutral position, then there's the ejection position. We can kick out our round, we can manually index, and then we can kick out our round. You guys get the idea. Now, before we go too much further into that, let's get a look at how the heck these rounds are staying in place. So if we manually operate this gun, so we fired it, right? At every point we fire the gun, you notice it kind of whips over center. And then at the moment of fire and at rest, we have mm, the wall between each chamber is aligned with our port. And therefore the rounds that would have been in here cannot escape. Instead, we have to manually mm, push that over into one of these detent positions that are put on the band of the cylinder in order to align for loading and unloading. When we're ready to fire the gun, we therefore turn just a little bit more and we end up in a rested neutral position, at which point it can kind of rock back and forth, but not enough to let anything escape the port. That neutral position is actually located about here if you're the lug on the trigger. This spot is lower than say this spot or this spot. The lowest spot of course being the valley right here. So this little plane is where our neutral resting position is. It's kind of wide. And then we can turn past it into one of the valleys for loading and then past that into the open plane in order to sort of rest in between firing. It's a very unique system. And of course, a leftover from wanting to have an automatic ejector and the ability to add one at any time. It's pretty wild. Returning to our ejector, we have one spring that actually does a lot of jobs. It's not so much that it just sort of over centers this into several positions. Yes, it does that. So we're here clicked in, we're here clicked in, and then in a moment, this is actually a sort of clicky spot too. It also affects the tip of, ooh, you know what, let me get into sequence here, that'd be a little smarter. It also affects the tip. So there's a notch right here on the ejector rod, which means that when I bring this all the way forward, you'll kind of hear it positively click into place, which means even if this accidentally gets swung over, it's not going to easily accidentally fall into your action and jam it. So very cool little feature. It's triple locked out essentially when we're in this position. It doesn't want to go back because it's being held by the arbor. It doesn't want to rotate over because it's being detented by the spring. And even if it did make it over, the spring is also detenting it to keep it from falling in. That's a lot of redundancy. This is a very strong and smart ejector rod system. Now that spring is got a little tooth on it that's down in there, hard to see. That tooth is going into the arbor. This gun is very old and it's worn. And to be honest with you, if I pull on the arbor, it will come out in this position. And I suspect it got that way from people not knowing any better. But what you're supposed to do is flip this all the way up, at which point this uh, spring cams up just a little bit more, the tooth comes out of the arbor, and then very, very easily, I can just pull the arbor out. That's the takedown position. The arbor itself does have one spring inside. This puts pressure on the inside of the cylinder and prevents uh, counter rotation when you're releasing the trigger. Now with that other way, hammer automatically rebounded, of course, we can just lift the cylinder right out. Six shots, you guys get the idea. Nothing fancy going on here other than I love this texturing to help me turn it whenever I'm loading and unloading. It's fantastic. Before we take down the rest of the gun, we actually do have some more work on this side because this screw, as originally constructed, was very thin uh, in terms of the slot, and you had to have a screwdriver in order to use it. However, uh, they quickly realized within just a few models being made that they could do this better. And so they cut the slot wider. As a matter of fact, it's just wide enough for a 10 wrappin coin, which will fit in there perfectly and allow us to take down the gun. You know what, let me go ahead and do that. Now, because the screw is captive to the frame, it will not come out at all, which means it forces the plate away from the frame. This is great because we'll never lose our screw and because it's going to go ahead 
and pull that frame out away, or pull the cover plate out away from the frame for us without us having to pry on anything like you would have had to do in the Shamlo Delveen. Once that's free, she'll swing away. Now we can just grab our trigger guard and swing the whole thing open. Ooh, it stays permanently attached to the hinge. Again, nothing to lose except for this meaty uh, hard rubber grip. This is the one separate piece at the moment. We'll set that aside. If we look at the action, this is radically simpler than the previous Shamlo Delveen because while we do have a trigger, hand, hammer, an arm, this is pretty new, uh, that is all being powered by, let's count the springs, are you ready guys? One, that's all the springs, that's it. There's this spring, there's the one we saw uh, that works on our ejector rod, and there's the very rudimentary spring that provides friction uh, to prevent counter rotation. Those are the three springs in this gun. This gun is a work of art. So this one, one V spring is doing a lot of work. And how is it doing it? Well, let's take a look. We have single action, at which point the projection off the front of the hammer catches the projection off the rear of the trigger. This of course is a very old Adam system that we've seen many times before in which we have two smoochy lips that come together. And when they break up, well, it all just comes crashing down. Uh, this same set of smoochy lips here off the front of the hammer also works for double action because you'll notice there's nothing, I mean, there's no nose, there's no strut position, there's just a little dust guard and that's it. There's nothing else really sticking off the front of this thing. And what's gonna happen is as we drop all this down and it rebounds, there is a shelf up behind the hammer or sticking out into the frame from the hand, or from the hand, I should say, not the hammer. I'm sorry, folks. The hand has a projection sticking down in the frame that is going to lip under this projection. And lip, it lipped under there. And now if we pull this trigger, it's going to push the hand up like it's supposed to to rotate the cylinder, but also the hand's gonna bring along the hammer, which means we don't need any extra springs for a strut or a nose or anything like that. When the hand clears, the hammer is able to fall. Boom. That's fantastic because our hand is biased forward by pressure from this overarching arm, which is powered by the other half of the mainspring, which is pushing on the hammer. This pressure on the hand not only biases it in the correct direction, but also puts pressure onto the trigger to return to its natural position. So therefore, all of this is accomplished off of one spring. Moreover, this arm has a corner to it, which I'll show you better in a moment, that is pressing on this extension at the bottom of the hammer. And so when we fire, boom, at this moment, because I'm pulling the trigger and the, therefore the hand is up, the hand is keeping the arm up and therefore compressed, right? When we decompress the arm, or well, decompress the spring, which then pushes the arm away, the arm is going to push on the bottom of the hammer and push it that way. That means the top of the hammer is gonna push the opposite direction, man or automatically, rebounding. Boom, back to the rebounded position. This is so wonderfully elegant in its simplicity of design. You would think, having accomplished all this, it would be something of a clockwork nightmare or something of a radically difficult thing to get in and out of. But in addition to all this, the gun is fairly easy to disassemble. As a matter of fact, they numbered it. Now the central arbor, he was marked number one. So that was our first part to remove. The cylinder actually has hidden on it a number two. I don't know if you guys will be able to make that out with the focus, but there is a number two there. So that's our second part to remove. I'm unsure if they count the gate as number three because it never actually comes off the gun. Hmm. But it, something must count as three because by the time we get to the mainspring, even though it's not marked, it's counting as number four. And I know this because the markings kind of reappear for number five, which is the arm. Number six is the hand. Number seven is the trigger and number eight is the hammer. So in order to do this, very simple. I rotate this guy just a quarter turn out of our way. And then uh, I'm gonna have to cover up what I'm doing a little bit, but all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put fairly mild pressure in cause I'm all the way at the far end of this lever point. I'm gonna push in and lift up a little bit, and then I'm gonna let it out nice and easy. And when I say nice and easy, this guy is actually really light because I'm so far out at the end of the lever. So I can very easily let that out. I'm not using a lot of strength. I am using a fair bit of balance because I don't want this slipping off. So I'm gonna cover that with my thumb just a little bit. Now, this arm was not included in the original Warnant design, nor was the hammer spur. The spur, or stirrup I should say, not spur, 
I can't speak to the guys, the star up rather. Uh, this guy smoothed out the operation of the hammer. This guy, I believe, was put in place because A, it was simpler to have it as a second part and not have to have an overly complicated spring, but B, just what I did. I have this lovely flex point that I can slide on, and therefore, I don't have to struggle to get this spring in and out like I might have to otherwise. Uh, in our Bodeo episode, they kept the original Warnant design in that the lower spring does all of that, and they included a key in order to keep the spring compressed, which was another solution not considered apparently by the Swiss. So if I take this guy out, we then go for number five, and then we then go for number six, and then seven and eight obviously can be lifted out. While we have it apart, let me show you how this guy works for rebound. We have this little shelf here, which works on this part of the hammer. So whenever this is in place, let me get, oops. You know, it's a little difficult to do without the other parts. There we go. Whenever I get that guy in place and she's down, when you have pressure this way, hammer go back. That's really all there is to it. And if you wanna see how that double action worked, well, we have this projection off the bottom of the hand. And so when he is in place, oops, this is always fun to do on camera. There we go. When he's in place and the hammer is oops, rebounded, then he's just gonna push back on that hammer until it clears, and then of course the hammer could fall. That's really the heart of this action. You notice nothing hidden up underneath, nothing wild and crazy, beautifully simple. Now I normally don't reassemble stuff while we're live, but because it is so ridiculously simple, let's just go ahead and oh, look how nice, all that leverage, all that ease, pop this guy around to lock her out, and boom, <laughs> I love this revolver. All right, that seems pretty straightforward, but just to make sure you've got it, let's go ahead with an animation. To load our pistol, we'll first manually index the cylinder into one of six D10 positions, each one aligning a chamber to the loading port on the right side of the frame. Then we can insert one round and manually rotate again in order to load the next. The six snap to load positions are created by an extension on the trigger, which springs into each of the six low points on the cylinder band. Once fully loaded, we'll just have to slightly rotate the cylinder so that the trigger is not resting in any of the loading notches. In this position, the cartridges cannot align with the loading port and therefore won't fall out. The Warnant lockwork is extremely simple. We'll start with the hammer, which we can cock back manually for single action fire. Here, the lower extension on the hammer snags on a projection from the trigger, remaining locked back until we give a gentle pull. Attached to the trigger is the hand. Like so many revolvers, this is responsible for engaging the ratchet teeth on the back of the cylinder, causing it to rotate. As the next chamber comes into alignment with the barrel, the second lug on the top of the trigger rises into one of six channels cut into the cylinder, holding it against the hand in the correct position. In Warnet's design, the hand also has a lower projection, which allows for double action fire. Pulling the trigger raises the hand, which snags under the hammer's extension, tipping the hammer back until it slips past, releasing the hammer to fall. The hand is constantly biased forward by pressure from this lever. The same pressure also drives the trigger back forward when released. The lever also interacts directly with the hammer. The end of its horizontal segment presses on the extended hammer body, pressing it forward and therefore the firing pin rearward when the trigger is released. That makes this an automatically rebounding hammer. Just to show that again, the lever is biasing the hand and returning the trigger, plus rebounding the hammer. Most amazingly, everything in this action is powered by one V-spring. In Warnet's original design, there wasn't even a lever. The lower spring arm did all the work. This external spring applies pressure to the ejector rod, retaining it when extended and providing a slight detent position when manually ejecting cases. Again, the cylinder must be manually aligned for each case. All right, let's go shoot it.
Thankfully, our outdoor range has a smoking section. Actually, I'm going to tell you, that was a bit of a trick of the light and the camera. It did not seem that smoky to the shooter. And it's the first time we've seen one show up that weirdly on camera. Anyway, rewinding just a bit, as the initial adoption of 1878 was being settled, Swiss authorities were deciding on production. Obviously, the Belgians would have preferred that they buy all or at least some of the guns from Scholberg, Ejede, and Liège, but the military department had their own ideas. For one, they felt like the trials and the involvement of their own engineers had materially changed Warnant's invention. They felt there was no special obligation to order abroad, and Waffenfrabach Bern would handle production. The Swiss did, however, negotiate a payment of 70 cents on each revolver produced over the next four years. I'm unsure of when that agreement was made, because if it was done in 1878, boy, did the Belgians get ripped off for the year that they took to really get production started. Okay, a final approval came in December of 1879. Production, however, had already begun in October. By April of 1880, the first series of 3,400 were complete. That's dang fast. A second delivery was made in 1881, this time only 1,200 units, and that's it. 4,600 units given over to the War Material Administration. However, I have seen quotes of up to 6,000 in total, and generally private purchases were a common feature of Swiss armament, so perhaps as many as 1,400 additional private Model 1878s may have been made. I've also seen note of a small production run from SIG at Neuhausen. I'm unsure if they account for any of this total. The cost to the government for each revolver was 45 Swiss franc. However, officers only paid 60% of that cost when purchasing them, so they were just out 27 franc. When adopted, the 1878 was for the armament of all mounted officers and NCOs excepting medical and administrative. Over time, this was expanded to cavalry and artillery, trumpeteers, quartermasters, and some issue to regular cavalrymen. Issue remained somewhat limited given the small number of pistols made. This was because by 1882, the 1878 was already being displaced. Although that's a bit of a story for another time as to why and how. The shortened version is that an inventory from November of 1892 finally showed Switzerland was running short of 10.4mm revolvers for their mounted troops. This was, by the way, a combination of the converted 1872s and the new 1878. A replacement order of 2000 was needed, but after review it was decided that it would be simpler to fill the requirement with the now much wider issued model of 1882, which chambered a newer 7.5mm cartridge. I wasn't able to find a date of obsolescence, but based on a conversation with my friend at Bloke on the Range, we can do some basic math to figure out how long this might have been in service. In late 1892, inventories were low, and it was decided not to produce more. So let's say they ran out of 1878s the very next year. Might have been longer though. Your youngest guys issued the 78 at the time would be about 20 years old, and they would retire out at age 48. So we add 28 years, that's 1921. However, a new 10.4mm cartridge with a now copper-coated bullet had been introduced just as soon as 1919. That can be explained two ways, though. A. More of the 1878s were still around than we think, or B. The ammo was made for private shooting, which was a very common thing for the military to do. Uh, plus, a handful of officers that were staying in for longer service as they got older into their 60s. Regardless, I'm fairly sure the old 10.4 was done for within a few years after the Great War. All right, let's go ahead and get May's opinion on shooting this rare beauty. All right, once more, we've made room for May. Yeah. And of course, we still have our Swiss 1878 revolver. Woo. One we could probably call a cavalry revolver, honestly, because it was for mounted officers. I see, because it's so shiny. That's why. I don't, why does shiny make it cavalry? That They, they need the shiniest of things. Wouldn't the shininess spook, spook the horse? I mean... Is, are you saying they shoot in front of the horse? No, but you're in line with other cavalry. Right, the horse it's all would behind see the, the horse. No, you don't ride abreast and only abreast. Oh, okay. Do they ride in a line with each other then? They would ride, you know... Anyway, okay. <sighs> Let's get May's first impressions on handling this particular revolver. Thank you. So, first impressions... God, it's so shiny. I feel like this is going to spook my horse. <laughs> Um, aside from that, uh, this is actually quite beautiful and ornate is the word maybe I'm looking for. There's just a lot going on in terms of... Ornate would imply that it had no utility. 
Right, I guess that's true. So it's it's a useful ornateness. What's a word for that? Yeah, it's got a um, it's got a lot of design going into it. There's yeah. plenty of surface texture. Uh huh. But all of it has function. All of it does have function. It is quite beautiful. Um, but okay, so it it looks different. It looks kind of cool. Um, it's kind of dense feeling as heck, but it's not too bad. It feels like it bounces all right in the hand. That grip. All of this kind of feels familiar. It's kind of reminding me of like a, a Nagant 78 almost. Yeah, the early um, large barrel Nagants. Yeah, I mean, don't get or me wrong. large bore, sorry. This is overall looking better, I mean, feature-wise. It's already looking like it's got better things going on than the 78, but it kind of does feel like it's it's got that kind of same scent to it. Yeah, it's definitely in that same scale. Now, yeah. uh, for me personally, I had seen photos of these for years before I ever got a hold of this one for the show. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, when this thing came in, I was surprised. Now, I knew it was in 10.4, so mm -hmm. my brain should have been able to do the math. Right. But no, once mm -hmm. it was in my hand, I went, oh, God, it's much larger than I thought. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a very old world revolver. It is a very large revolver. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, aside from that, uh, so I kind of like the fact that whenever we go to operate this gun, everything kind of feels like it clicks into place. And I was talking to Athias about this off camera for at the very beginning before we even got started. It kind of reminds me of like doing Legos. Everything kind of feels like it clicks and sets into where it's supposed to be with the cylinder, with the ejector rod. Everything has its set placement for where it the click is set for. That's that's actually really cool. Right. You've described that you have a sort of kinesthetic joy with certain things like certain revolvers or rolling block rifles. Yeah. Like Out of all the revolvers we've handled, <laughs> this one probably has the best clickiness to it, the best kinesthetic feel to it. I mean, the only other thing that is in the similar realm of that would probably be like a single action army or something like that. Right. And this, here, may I see that? Sure. This does the single action army thing of let's do some single action. Ooh, Ooh, all sorts of clicks. That sounds really good. Yeah, I like those clicks. Ah, uh, but we we pointed out before it's got the rebound. Yeah, so if I then fire it, uh -huh. and it would, it would go clack or boom. Right, sure, and assume. even then when I release, even more clicks. All right, that's actually pretty cool. And then for loading... Ah, oh, that sounds so good. So many clicks. I know. And then the ejector rod, it's got the click for... Wait, okay, so okay. I know it's got the side... So, yep. Clicks? Uh-huh, position two. Okay. Okay. Now and what? then you're able to do ejecting with that one. Yeah. Which Very also positive. is, it's not just clicking because I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. It's clicking on the return because the spring is catching. Right. And providing a detent. It, this is the most mechanically satisfying ejector I have ever handled. It actually is pretty rad. I mean, the fact that you can literally turn up the ejector rod in order to then pull out the arbor and then remove the cylinder, that's pretty rad. Yeah, all in the one spring. Yeah. But also just using it, I don't know about you, I found it to be so positive that unlike many other ejector rod revolvers we handled, I have never accidentally tied up the action by not quite removing the ejector rod all the way out. You know, it's kind of interesting you're talking about that. I feel like... Out of all the revolvers we handled, this is probably the only one I think I could successfully run in the dark. And like from start to finish, load and fire and unload and be able to successfully repeat that sequence. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think without the loading gate, you might get paranoid that you were in the wrong position. Right. But even that is covered because if you're in the detented loading position, if you grab the cylinder and give it a little wiggle... Mm -hmm. It, it only wiggles a little tiny bit. Right. But if you're in the ready to rock and roll position, you got this sort of hazy, you know, generous area. So, oh, yeah. This is definitely a generous amount of wiggle here. Yeah. So in the dark, I can absolutely tell the difference between which position I'm in in the cylinder, whether it's go or no go. Yeah. I can't think of any revolver that it meets all those check marks in terms of being able to just tell what state this gun is in. Yeah. That's pretty rad. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So, um... Let's see, we've discussed just the general size, the clickiness. The general feels, yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that really stands out remarkably about this gun? How awkward is it, you know what, while we're talking about this, how mm -hmm. awkward is it? Is it to load this gun? Because you do have to grab the cylinder, which is something that, you know, we usually think in terms of sort of gently tipping it or rotating it with your index finger, but you actually have to torque on it enough that they put uh, checkering on that. Did you find that to be really a hassle or no? No, yeah, honestly, I, uh, I found it kind of... I think the checkering is a good idea, but I found myself just in general grabbing the whole of the cylinder because right. I don't know why it's just it was just quicker for me to grab essentially right here on the ridge and just torque it there. 
Um, but I, I do like the idea of the knurling they put here. It's not as aggressive as I would think they would have ex put, um, this normally put on there, though. It feels kind of... Does that feel aggressive to you? Am I crazy? Well, I think it's not really... Pat it's patterned more to resist forward and back. Yeah, I guess than so. Than it is to, to resist lateral movement, which right. is exactly what you're going for. Mm -hmm. So I find that I actually end up using the flutes. I tend oh, to put really? my fingers into the, you're a flute the flute. Man. So yeah. you're a flute man, and I'm a... Uh... Are you reaching for another instrument? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Did you <laughs> find one? No, I, I got nothing. You should have said drum. Uh, oh, oh, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's too late. Dang, I got nothing you should, The improv I'm is out. strong. I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just carry the show myself. Please. <laughs> Can anybody suggest a setting? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, really, uh, I, I found that that was the one thing I noticed is that I was gripping in a different area than it was wanting me to grip at. And then on top of that, it actually is pretty stiff. There is no, there is no half-assing that turn. You've definitely got to make sure you rotate it all the way. It's also a little awkward to one hand. Yeah, you definitely can't one hand this guy. I'm going to oh, say I definitely can. 20 you say that? No, today, I'm male. I, I can unhand it all day. Look, here I go. Oh, Mr. Showoff. Oh, yeah. you, oh look. Well, you, were you trying to do one at a time? Or were you well, trying I mean, to do I was just doing it in a hurry to show I mean, you. If you can't do like one at a time, I guess I, it's just... I will say, in, in her defense, it is a little awkward to do one hand at one at a time, but you could get the hang of it. Yeah, it's true. Especially if, if, if you're... If I was practiced with it. I think on range, if I remember correctly. Yeah, no, I can do that. It would take a little... Oh, I think I went too. Yeah, I can get used to that. Okay. Yeah. It's something, again, just off the cuff, you know, first time handling. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. the easiest no, to excuses. do. excuses. Excuse Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. So, uh, we've managed to load the gun, yep. even though May can't handle it. And uh, now we're ready to fire it. Uh -huh. How, how's that? What's going on there? Well, uh, with the firing, um, looking down the sights, which I do have in single and double. So, hey, right, you know, older guns, sometimes it's kind of not a thing. <laughs> yeah, the Colt 1877, man. Yeah. Do you want your rear sight? Only if you're doing single action. <laughs> Otherwise, screw you. No, um, it's got a really nice raised front bead sight, and it's got a, basically a U-notch in the rear that's kind of raised as well, so bead in a bucket. Not bad. Yeah. It actually was pretty decent. I, I find them to be quite tall. For yeah, the time. they're surprisingly tall, so hey, good job there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then cocking the hammer. It's a bit stiff, but frankly, it's a little, it's very smooth. It's right. a very smooth pull all the way through, and I liked it. I had a good time with that. I found the spur to be in the right spot. I didn't have to break up my grip too much to get to it. Yeah, no, it actually, and even just letting it down, yeah, it's it's, it's very like, easy a, to a do. A lot of double action revolvers, the early ones, it, I found them kind of difficult to get my hand into the single action position mm -hmm. because they were designed specifically for double action. Right. This one, I don't have to creep too far to get that hammer. I actually enjoyed it. No, you know, I'd say that they definitely designed this one for either use, single or double action, because even saying that, the trigger is quite nice too. Right. So, oh yeah, they've got a great hammer. They've got a great trigger. I guess they want me to use it in all the forms it can be used Yeah, you're used talking about in. the double action trigger is fairly light. Yes. Yeah. And then the single action, of course, trigger pull is also not too bad. I, I found that it had a little bit of a hook. Yeah. In single, like you go into single mm -hmm. and you go to pull and there's just a little bit of a wall. I mean, there is, but so it's not, I don't mind it. No, but it's not like you get with like a later Colt or something where... No, it's you, definitely not just ready to go yeah, You breathe on it and it drops. No. no, there's a little bit of a shelf. But you still need intention. Okay, I will agree with you on that. You need intention with the single action. Very common for that period of military revolvers, though, is the idea that you actually do mean to fire it even in single action. Mm, okay. um, I don't think it would throw your aim at all. Uh, double action, we both found to be very pleasant. Right. For the time, very light. I wouldn't say, again, it's not as light as I think a lot of people here would have maybe handled something like a Smith & Wesson K-frame or like a Colt, maybe a post-police positive mid-frame Colt, you know? Yeah, okay. Those are going to be a little smoother than this. Mm -hmm. But we're getting pretty close and we're getting there very early. This yeah, is that's surprising. We handled an 1878 revolver mm -hmm. from Colt. Yeah. Was it anywhere smooth as this? No, not even close. No. So, so that's pretty impressive. Okay. And then um, recoil from there, you know, 10.4 smoke powder, you know. Smoke powder? Yeah, I'm sorry. My brain is just <laughs> black gone. Powder. Thank you, black powder. Hey, I couldn't think of the word. It's, smoke powder. It, you uh, know, is there's plenty of smoke on the screen. I won't argue with you there. Yeah, no, I uh, definitely was not expecting that, especially when I was shooting, because frankly, when I was shooting the gun, I didn't really notice a significant amount of smoke. I mean, I want to say on the last shot, I think I remember thinking... Yeah, there's a lot of smoke right in front of me. I can still, you know, see the target, but I still just happened to just at one point be like, I wonder how that looks on the camera. <laughs> well, so I think this is very unique. We we shoot uh, black powder out of a number of guns. Right. And generally, we'll actually use Pyrodex a lot of the time because it's a it's twofold. I know people get mad at me for this, but it is twofold, especially when we get into the 1870s and things like that. Mm-hmm. 
even the black powder wasn't as smoky as early black powder. Right. And we tend not to have a lot in the market for a semi-smokeless powder, which wasn't really a thing, but it was a thing. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they'd cut down the smoke, they'd get the loads right, there'd be less smoke. Right. Um, there was still smoke, but there was less. Yeah. So Pyrodex does an okay job of emulating that for us, and it's available and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. In this case, we actually did do black powder. Yep. Um, just because that was what was at the table at the time. And then two, for whatever reason, the the light was low, mm -hmm. the camera was here. And there and was then no the, wind. Right. The, the, the wind just died. Which, which normally is perfect for us. Oh, yeah, it's great. Except for this time, it just all the smoke just bundled up around that gun yeah. in front of the camera. And then eventually it just disappeared. Yeah. And we were both like... What the hell? Okay, I guess yeah. this is just that. That was the footage we had of that day. We were both very surprised by the footage when we got it back because we, you know, you do the initial preview and you're like, "Wow, it looks great. Everything's in focus. Let's yeah. go." And no, and it's now. like boom, ninja smoke. Bomb. <laughs> so ninja smoke bomb. I, I'm sorry that there wasn't much of the gun to see in that footage. Actually, we even edited it a little differently to try to keep the yeah. gun in the. I know I didn't show my normal final shot of <laughs> yeah. my face. I was like, because I had done. Like you, you basically see me like appear from a cloud of smoke. If I had known, I'd have been off camera with like a manual fan, just like <laughs> come on, let's just get where we can see this gun. It should have been in the wide shot where you were just like fanning me in the background. Yeah. <laughs> just a big palm. Frond. We're in Charleston. Right. I could have pulled one from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, sorry about the interruption, but uh, no, the gun wasn't as smoky as it seems on camera. It yeah. was kind of smoky, but nowhere near that bad. Mm -mm. Um, shots on target. How to do? You know, my grouping wasn't too bad. Um, there was one, I think, that if I remember correctly, went a little bit high. And I want to say that was my last shot because, like I said, I think it was the last shot. That I was that us. most obscure, scared in the smoke in the front of me. It was literally like I started to pile up right in front of me. And I just finally noticed, it. I want to say I remember on the final shot, just be like, that's a lot. <laughs> and then your brain's like, oh, I'm shooting. <laughs> Still got him. Okay. But it's a little bit higher than I anticipated. So, yeah, yeah. I think it was okay. Yeah, I noticed your group was just a little bit off center, I believe, to yeah, the right. Yeah, it was a little bit to the, no, it was a little to the left. No, it was. Well, oh, you're you're left his right. Yeah, so I got him real good and not, not the heart. heart. Yeah. yeah, but his, um, his lung is done though. <laughs> to be fair, it could be that those sights took a wang somewhere over the years and it's are possible. just a little off to one side. But uh, the grouping itself was immaculate for yeah, not bad. what you were doing. Um, I I found it to be a trustworthy revolver. Yeah. I don't, uh, what's your opinion? Honestly, I I thought there really was very little to find negative about it with my experience. Um, Everything about it as a shooter was very easy for handling. Um, it was good for repeatable shots. The only thing that would have made it better would have been something like an Abity system addition oh, to yeah, it. Well. What? Hmm. What did I just say? It does have no no loading or unloading system. Right. Now, do you think that you would find an improvement in this revolver if it had an ejector system that even... Let's imagine that the ejector system worked perfectly. Do you think that would really be a big benefit in this gun? I guess it's regarding any mechanical issues. Uh, frankly, I feel like there was going to be an issue with the auto ejector if they put it on this guy because you were not always going to have your sixth round because essentially... You, you kick out the live one whenever you fire right, your first round. Right, so you've round. always got five, and then that means that on top of having the five, you then have to dry fire it at some point to kick that last round out anyway. Right. So even, so, if, even if you design an auto ejector where you somehow stack it so that it doesn't kick the first one and you get all six shots. Yeah, and that's the auto ejector they planned on putting this one. There are obviously better auto ejectors out there. Right, right. So let's say they got it right, and it doesn't even kick that first round, mm -hmm. okay? And then it starts kicking rounds. You still have to one, two, three, four, five, six, and yeah, then consciously remember to do seven, and then load your because next Because that's one. what I want to do, is when I'm pulling out my revolver, which I'm assuming is an emergency situation to be using it anyway, I want to be able to do math at the same time. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel like there's some validity there. For I, mathing on the fly. Well, no, think about the time you're saving because if you're indexing and ejecting, so I fired all six and now I got to sit here and do this. And even if I had an Abity and I was going really fast, right, I still got to sit here and get them all out. That's true. Then switch gears to loading and indexing and loading mm -hmm. versus if it was unloading the entire time, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I just fire one more time. It kicks the ejection, it kicks the empty out. Mm -hmm. And then I just have to sit here and load. And that's all I have to focus on. And even if I can just get three in there and just start firing again or something, I, I I could see that being something that I would want. However, it comes with a lot of mechanical baggage mm -hmm. that no one seemed to be able to get resolved to the point that it didn't cause the potential for misfire from the hammer or the potential for rounds to get missed. And when they, you saw, 
Uh, I had one that when my struck lightly, it partially ejected. A partially ejected case is going to jam the action mid-firing. Right. And the more you shoot, the more likely that is to happen. I just, yes, in a world where there's no mechanical problems, the auto-ejector sounds cool AF. Mm-hmm. But there's so many mechanical problems. Yeah. I think I'd prefer this over having the auto-ejector on there. Me too. At I'll, least for the time being. However, I do say that the biggest weakness in this gun is the lack of any sort of aid to loading and unloading. Yeah. Because you are responsible for manually indexing. Well, you as are I said, like an Abity system addition would be a good call. Yeah, or top break if it was just... Yeah, even that. Don't forget, um, Schmidt's original idea way back in 1877 was to have the entire thing pivot in half and then eject. I mean, they could have it rotate to the side or something That's like that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It would oh, pivot. Okay, yeah. Like the hinge that the uh, gate, that the side plate's on. Imagine mm-hmm. if that hinge actually had the front half of the revolver turned sideways. Okay, yeah. And then you'd pop an ejector. Sure. I, that would be way faster, mm-hmm. but they really wanted a solid frame gun. Or they could spear lay it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just pop it open or, yeah. or Smith & Wesson it or something. Yeah, there's a lot but of ways to go about that. All of those were considered too weak. Mm-hmm. And then they futzed around with auto ejector. Right. I can't, can't even. Like, I just, okay, Switzerland, you They couldn't do make you. up their mind, yeah. so they just went with what they had. Uh, so you Which find, is still pretty cool. Yeah. Big reveal. Next episode, you'll get your wish for something to help yeah. with that. But uh, it's that an is, auto ejector. <laughs> it is the downside of the system. However, for 78, there is nothing like this on the Colt. Right. There is nothing like this in the British guns. Nope. As a matter of fact, they didn't have the detent positions. Nope. The so, Nagant didn't have anything. Right. The Belgian. And then, okay, sure, you get an auto ejector like a uh, Smith & Wesson. Mm-hmm. But then they don't have the automatic rebound, and it's potentially dangerous snapping those things shut. Right. I think... I think there's something to be said for this. Yeah, not bad. Right. All right. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, for that's pretty much everything. Gun. Now, this, of course, it, it was in Switzerland, a neutral country. Right. But it did serve all the way through World War II. Kind of cool. Yeah, or World War One, not World War II. Yeah, I knew what you meant. Yeah. I mean, they didn't. Now they do. Yeah. <laughs> well, they heard the earlier part. Um, you assume they watched the episode. <laughs> this is not necessarily what we consider one of our World War One primers, but... no. In a conflict as late as World War One, which mm-hmm. would be the latest that this gun would serve, sure. Would you be confident with something like this? You know, I have been singing the praises on this guy this whole episode practically, but there are actually two big issues with it. One, black powder. In World War One, there's a lot of smokeless powder options out there, so that's already going to be a downside there, huge one. And then two, again, we've already talked about it. There's no auto eject, no load assist system in this guy, whereas at the time of World War One tons of other revolvers slash semi-automatic pistols out there that way rank over this guy. So unfortunately, I'd actually have to give it a no for World War One. I've got Boo. significantly better Boo. options. World War Boo. One. For the time of its Boo. invention, it's actually pretty dang great. Oh, it's smoking the competition. Right? In, yeah, in its invention. Has smoking yeah, because there's, it's black there's powder. The only it's arguably smoking. better guns are ones that have top break simultaneous eject at yeah. the time. And even that's arguable for certain things. Right. right? Um, I mean, all those old Smith & Wessons have problems today that I have to repair. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, but World I, War One? No. Heck no. Don't it's, forget, by the way, the same year, 1879, that they finally put this into production, right? Right. Um, is the same year Germany's adopting the Reichs Revolver. I know. <laughs> like, just come on, Germany. And they brought it back again in 83. Ah, Reichs Revolver times two. <laughs> I honestly would assess this as a very slight yes. Um, what is wrong with you? I love it. For I, World War One, I? I can. Oh, I can. It feels beautiful in my. hand. It fits my hand beautifully. I mean, yeah. And then I am extremely confident in the ability of the cartridge to kill a man, which is what I would need to do to defend myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm also confident in my ability to point it quickly and accurately. Okay. I'm confident in the trigger uh, in double action. It's extremely smooth. And it works very well. Mm-hmm. And I'm not at all bothered by the cartridges falling out or anything like that. It just doesn't worry just me. just catch them and throw them back in. No, they're not going to fall out. I'd have to be firing dead up in the air for them to fall out. I mean, what it's, if there's a guy above you? Then I'll lose one cartridge when I yeah, fire immediately losing. 100%. You've only got five shots Like, to if I'm out. even a slight angle off, they're not coming out. Like, sorry, it's great. Um... We should have actually tested that at some point. <laughs> I'm not even worried about black powder cartridge, not in a handgun. What I'm worried about, again, is the loading and unloading, because I will say you get six rounds, and then the way this thing is done, you're out of the fight. You know, I am kind of curious. We didn't actually get to test it because we didn't have enough rounds or time to really do it, but I would have liked to have seen how much fouling it would have taken to actually tie up that gun from the black powder. 
Mm, yeah. Well, to be fair, with a handgun, by the time you're using it, you're hoping to not have to clear two cylinders. Yeah. But clearing the second cylinder has been important many times in combat, and getting to the second cylinder is the biggest but downside of this gun. I will say, it was definitely not shiny even after just one cylinder set through that guy. No, you had to wipe it. Down. Yeah, we had oh, to wipe it. Oh, there's a lot of power. But, um, <laughs> no, I just, to me, that puts it very much at, at the very low end of acceptable for that period just because of slow reload. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I mean, when I say slow reload, these detents are cool. We like them. But you can roll them back and forth a little bit and get out of time. Right. And if you're really blood pumping in a hurry and you're trying to do this with your left hand while working the rod with your right, you're going to double past and then miss it it's and then have gaps. It's very easy sometimes to do it. Yeah, it's not... Like, I can roll one way or I can accidentally so I'm in this detent position I can accidentally roll back right so it's not even like as much as we say it's better than the say 1878 or something mm -hmm. in some of those guns you can you can't roll back from the loaded position right. so you can always sort of go forward hear the click roll back load go forward hear the click roll back load mm -hmm. and there's a back pressure that is you'd have to use hundreds of pounds of force to break that and on this I can just detent right past it the other way right the loading is really the downside on this gun yep yeah. 100% but I love it. Oh, I love it too. Just because I give it a note for World War One doesn't mean I don't love it. Yeah, how do you feel about it in terms of collectability? Just like cool factor. Oh, no, it's definitely got that high cool factor because I can't think of any other revolver that is even close to that in terms of that kinesthetic joy you get from that, from like a rolling block. I don't know. Same I've seen deal. you with, say, like a Russian number three. Those are pretty rad. Yeah. With a spur at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are kind of cool. I don't know. You know what? This might have bumped the Russian number three for me. In terms of coolest collectible oh, revolver. I can see that, yeah. I don't know why. Maybe it's just the way I care about the mechanism and things, or the fact that it has no loading gate whatsoever. It just sort of, there's something I really love about the fact that it, it just sort of relies on you to it trust. It does it. It's, you're fine. You have to trust the timing. You know what I mean? And there's something like as an engineering mindset where you're just like, okay, that's pretty cool. But um, as of right now, and I know I'm biased because we just did this episode, this is my favorite historical revolver. Ooh. Just in terms of how neat it is. Or so. maybe, maybe that will change next episode. Maybe? No, no. Oh, my God. Don't spoil it. Okay, I was maybe. picking them out. Maybe. Oh, my God. All right. Y'all have a good one. <laughs> Night, everybody. All right, gang, I have wonderful news for today's update because we are releasing a poster specifically for the Hand Trap series, celebrating, of course, the star of the show, Kevin, as he has reminded us every episode. Now you can see Kevin as Kevin sees himself, the king of hand traps, majestic in his glory. And for a limited time, it comes with an exclusive May sticker. Ooh. Also, the price has been reduced. And then if you want it mm, 30 days after this, well, you got to pay a little bit more, right? The whole reason for this, by the way, is to make sure that we have funding in order to do the next season of the Hand Trap series. And of course, any overflow from that will go towards the usual content. Now, I have had a couple people say that they prefer for us not to do extra work on something as silly as the Hand Trap series, but one, you don't know how to have fun, because this is by far the most entertaining thing we've ever done. And two, it really takes a lot less effort than a normal episode, like less than 5% of the effort for a normal episode. So it's a very good way for CNR to get content out there and for you guys to get a little look behind the glass and see a little more of our humanity. If you haven't checked out those episodes, please do and consider getting this poster. I recommend a smaller size because frankly, it's too much glory for a 24 by 36. Anybody who selects that is probably the bravest person I know. All right, have a good one.